Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. Good morning, sir. All right, that's great. Welcome to the session. Thank you. A very good morning to everyone present here. We are delighted to have you all here for this session. So without any ado, I'll take the privilege to introduce our esteemed speaker for today, Mr. Monish Pabrai. Mr. Monish Pabrai is the owner and managing director of Pabrai Investment Fund, which is a globally recognized firm that manages a portfolio of more than $400 million in assets and has exhibited a tremendous historical track record. What makes the fund stand out is that it is one of the very few funds across the globe that does not charge a management fee. Monish Pabrai is also the chairman and CEO of Thando Holding, whose primary objective is to acquire high quality businesses with high quality management in place in a friendly manner. Not only this, he has also authored a book called Thando Investor, which has been of great interest for all aspiring investors. Apart from his excellent trajectory in the professional field, what makes Sir all the more inspiring to us is his inclination towards philanthropy, which is reflected in his founding of the Dakshana Foundation back in 2007. Dakshana Foundation has gotten over 1,146 impoverished but brilliant students admitted to the IIT. Thank you for coming, sir. The virtual floor is all yours. Thank you, uh, and thank you for that uh, uh, generous introduction. I uh, I appreciate it, and. Uh, uh, anyway, great to great to be here. And uh, you know, one of the great things about the uh, investing business is that, uh, unlike many other endeavors, like uh, if you play basketball or cricket or something else, is that you can keep getting better uh, at this uh, throughout your life. And uh, so it's kind of a uh, an endeavor where uh, continuous improvement and learning. Uh, is possible and actually desirable, which is which is wonderful. And uh, so, what I wanted to actually uh, kind of talk to you about today is that when we look at this uh, large tent uh, called value investing, uh, it it encapsulates quite a range of uh, approaches and uh, focuses one could have. Uh, while trying to uh, you know, create wealth and uh, generate good returns and so on. Uh, so, uh, so for example, uh, you know, buying a dollar that is uh, trading for 50 cents uh, would be a great way to be a value investor, uh, focusing on spin-offs, uh, which Joel Greenblatt wrote about is another way, focusing on cannibals, which is companies that are buying back their stock, uh, you know, looking at uh, what I call spawners, which is businesses that are really good at, uh, you know, creating uh, new businesses and, uh, and then, you know, spinning those off. So that's, that's another way one can go. And uh, focusing on uh, multi-baggers, uh, is also uh, is also well within the within the tent of value investing, and uh, you know one could do special situation investing, merger arbitrage. It's it's a it's a long list of uh, uh, endeavors and initiatives. You know Ben Graham uh, suggested net net investing and so on. So there's many different approaches one can take. Uh, which would all be within the tent of value investing. Uh, you know, they say that you're old too soon and wise too late. Uh, and I've, I've, you know, made investments over the last uh, quarter century or more, which have covered pretty much uh, almost all of these uh, different ways of uh, looking at things. You know, we also have things like P or ones, you know, things trading at low multiples or future VO ones and that sort of thing as well. Uh, what I've been able to glean 
when I look at all of these different initiatives or different approaches that one can take, is that, uh, you know, across the globe, there are maybe 50,000 or 100,000 stocks in different markets around the world. And if one were to say that I only want to invest in companies that are trading at one or two times earnings, one can find those. Uh, if one, you know, cast the net wide and deep. Uh, if one said, I only want to buy 50 cent dollars or 30 cent dollars or 20 cent dollars, you would find those as well. So pretty much, I think, uh, because the uh, universe of uh, prospective businesses is so wide and so large, uh, pretty much uh, any criteria you set uh, could work. Uh, I think the important thing is that one is very focused uh, in, one, in what one is looking for and has clarity of what one is looking for. Uh, I've, I've come to the conclusion, uh, and it's actually a pretty, you know, it took me a long time to figure this out, but I think for most of you, it would, uh, would seem obvious, is the, if there is such a thing as a best approach out of all of these approaches, uh, the best approach I think would be one where one focuses on multi-baggers, you know, businesses that can be a 10X in 10 years or less, or maybe a 100X in 20 years or less. Uh, so if one, if one focused purely on the multi-baggers, uh, there are some advantages that come up uh, with that approach. Uh, one advantage is that, uh, one doesn't have much in terms of taxes. So because you'd be holding businesses for a long time, under most jurisdictions around the world, uh, until the positions are sold, uh, unrealized gains are not taxed. So basically it gives you an advantage and depending on the place on the planet that you practice this, you know, sometimes the tax rates can be as high as you know, 40, 50%. And uh, so deferring that for decades or let's say 10 years or more uh, is a huge advantage because you get a free uh, interest-free loan um, from the government. So, so there's an advantage in terms of uh, taxes with this approach. Uh, the second advantage is that you don't have this continuous treadmill of needing to, you know, find something undervalued, then it gets, you know, fairly valued and, and then you sell it and then you go look for something else. So the multi-bagger the multi-bagger approach to investing has a few quirks and it requires us to kind of change our mindset uh, on a few fronts. So one of, the, one of the changes one has to make is that, you know, traditionally, traditionally when one looks at what Ben Graham, uh, kind of the you know, father of value investing taught us, is that you buy something for well below what it's worth. And then as it approaches fair value, you sell the position. And, uh, and then you, you know, go look for something else. But in, a, in the multi-bagger framework, uh, what, what you would do is you would actually not particularly care if a position uh, became fully valued or even overvalued. Uh, so for example, if, if you bought, uh, you know, a business for 30, 40 cents on the dollar. And it's growing, that dollar is growing. And at some point it's worth a dollar 50, for example, it's gone up more than 50% over what it used to be worth. But the stock is trading at $2, for example. 
And uh, so under traditional Grammian approaches, you would sell that as you get past the dollar fifty or whatever. But in in the quest for multi-baggers, uh, you would continue to keep it in your portfolio even when it became overvalued. You would, you would sell it if it became egregiously overvalued. So one would need to distinguish between something that's overvalued and something that's egregiously overvalued. So let's, uh, let's look at some examples uh, of businesses that, and you know, that might help explain uh, kind of where this approach is coming from and how it might work and so on. So if, if, we, look at, uh, if we look at a business like uh, let's say McDonald's, for example, uh, you know, McDonald's was, uh, was formed in the, I mean, it, it, I mean, the business existed, but Ray Kroc took it over in the 1950s. I, I think they went public in the 1960s. And uh, it's been public for maybe almost 60 years uh, since then. And uh, it's still growing. So uh, their, uh, you know, their number of restaurants, revenues, uh, profits, et cetera. Uh, I mean, it's gone through some ups and downs over the years, but it's, it's, it's grown and it's grown spectacularly. And, and I think from the time it went public till now, uh, it's north of a 10,000 bagger, you know, Every dollar you invested is worth more than ten thousand dollars. Not a not a ten bagger or hundred bagger. It's like a ten thousand plus bagger. And why why did why did McDonald's uh, do so well? So it did well because it you know there were uh, in the early days when when it got going there were a number of initiatives, uh, a number of innovations that McDonald's had come up with. Uh, some of you might have seen the movie, uh, The Founder. Uh, I think The Founder is, I think it's on Netflix. I'm not sure if it's on Netflix in India, but you might want to uh, uh, take a, you know, I think it's a, it's a very good movie to see. Uh, there's also a, biography that got written uh, on McDonald's called uh, Grinding It Out. Uh, it's also a good book. It's a very old book, but it's a great book to read. And um, there's, another, there's another book uh, which was written by the, the first CEO of Burger King. Uh, it's called The Burger King. And that's actually an amazing book as well. Uh, but basically, one of the early innovations McDonald's came up with was that uh, everything they sold could be eaten without a fork or a spoon or a knife. There was no uh, kind of cutlery needed to, you know, French fries, you could just take it from your hand and so on. And uh, the, other th the other big innovation was that uh, it was served really fast. Uh, you know, the, the production time. And actually, if you really study McDonald's internal processes and how it functions, it's kind of like a light manufacturing type operation. And the, the software and engines they use internally is like what you would use in a light manufacturing operation. And, uh, and of course, like, for example, uh, they were very specific about the way the French fries should be with the Russell potato. So in fact, like, for example, when McDonald's enters a new country, uh, like India or Russia, et cetera, it takes them two or three years from the time they decide to enter to the time they can open their first restaurant because it takes a couple of years to train the farmers and generate the supply chain for the right kind of potatoes and such. So it takes, uh, takes them sometimes 
more than a couple of years just to open the restaurants and such. But the interesting thing about something like McDonald's is that um, almost all the innovations they came up with, there were a lot of copycats. And uh, there were many businesses that came up that cloned or tried to clone what they were doing. And, uh, and in general, fast food became a huge industry uh, with many players. Uh, it wasn't just burgers, you know, we then got a big, uh, huge uh, kind of growth in pizzas, chicken, KFC. So, you know, a lot of different uh, entrants came in. And also I think the, uh, on the consumer side, it also changed in terms of what the frequency people were looking to eat all of this stuff. But anyway, uh, even with all of that uh, competition, uh, McDonald's was able to establish a brand and people knew before they went into a restaurant, any McDonald's, what to expect. The kind of standardization and, and uh, you know, consistency, uh, the cleanliness, the consistency and, and the nature of the service worked. So that particular moat has been going strong for 60 years. And uh, there aren't really any signs that say that the moat is eroding and may not do so well in the future. They continue to do well. And it's a high, it's a very high return on equity business. So basically, if you think about a franchised McDonald's, um, where you know an entrepreneur, you know, uh, you know, does a contract with the McDonald's Corporation. So, in a franchise situation, uh, in the United States at least, a lot of the real estate is owned by the McDonald's Corporation, and the rent, uh, the rent that is charged to the franchisee, is a percentage of sales, like maybe around 4% of sales is the rent. So if you think about the rent uh, that McDonald's charges its franchisees, it's kind of automatically inflation indexed. You know, uh, it just goes up with inflation. They also charge a franchise fee, you know, for the right to use the brand, et cetera. That might be another 4% or so. And then uh, the franchisees also buy a lot of the products they need from McDonald's. And usually what McDonald's and a lot of the other franchise type operations will do is they tend not to focus on making money on the products. Uh, they tend to focus on you know, passing that through, but you have the two main engines of the franchise fees and the rent, which might be something like seven, eight percent off the top line. So if you look at it from the McDonald's corporation's point of view, a typical McDonald's in the US might have something like two or three million in annual sales. And the McDonald's corporation might get something like, you know, 150, 200,000 a year um, from, that, from that location. The capital they have to put up against that is almost non existent uh, because it's the entrepreneur who's, you know, paying for all the CapEx and the maintenance CapEx and all of that. So it's a really capital light business. So the, the three legs that we need, uh, you know, I think Chuck Akri calls it the three-legged stool. The three legs that we need for these long multi-baggers is first of all, the core economics of the business should have very high returns on invested capital, ideally without the use of use of debt, right? So you basically, uh, like McDonald's doesn't need to borrow money to make a lot of money. Um, the second is that um, we want very high integrity management and we want insider ownership, you know, kind of alignment of interest. Where there's a smart entrepreneur or someone or insiders who own it, so they've got, incentives. And the third is that we want a very long runway. Uh, 
So where we can see that this thing can go on for a very long time. And I think that when we, you know, if you were to pick up the annual report of, let's say, Walmart, for example, Walmart went public, I think, in 1972 or something. It's like been public for like 50 years. And um, if you picked up the annual report of Walmart, let's say, in 1980, for example, a few years, seven, eight years after they went public, you would see that they've got very superior economics at the store level, uh, that they generate high returns on equity. It's, it's a business that does well, uh, very, very rapid turnover inventory and so on. And you would also see that it was embryonic in the sense that large portions of the United States at that time, 1980, still did not have a Walmart. For most people, you could not get to a Walmart within you know, 10, 15 kilometers of your home. So you could see that basically this uh, business could actually, if you, if you just looked at it in, in North America, there was a lot of room to grow. And what we've seen with McDonald's is that it, uh, or, or Walmart is that it wasn't just a US story. You know, it was a global story. So Walmart has, you know, opened up in other countries and done well. And, um, and, and you know, we could look at other, other businesses, like let's say the Coca-Cola company. You know, the Coca-Cola company was formed about 100 and, 30 years ago, and that moat is still growing after 130 years. And again, the unit economics are extremely attractive because the Coca-Cola company typically doesn't do bottling. They sell the syrup and, and uh, so they have you know, these plants which sell, they don't even sell the syrup, they sell syrup concentrate. Uh, and so basically, it's almost like a software business where you know if you're if you're spending five or ten rupees on a on a Coke, uh, Coca Cola company might get like eight percent of that, and they would have very little cost against that. Uh, so again, it's it's very similar to McDonald's in terms of uh, uh, in terms of economics. So basically, there are, there are businesses, different kinds of businesses. You can look at a business like MasterCard or Visa or American Express, and they have similar attributes where you have very high returns on invested capital. Uh, you have a very long runway, and you have high integrity management with inside ownership and so on. And so if one pursues these now, you know, the nature of capitalism is that everyone wants to own these kinds of businesses. And so once these kind of moats and, you know, runways, et cetera, are well known, the businesses get priced to perfection. And they may not be available at a cheap price. And so, for example, if we look at a business in India, um, like DMART, for example, and DMART, you know, similar model to Costco and Aldi outside India, and DMART is very embryonic today. There's very few DMART stores in India relative to what could possibly be their penetrations in 10, 20, or 30 years. But the market recognizes that. And so DMART trades at you know, huge multiples. Uh, it doesn't appear optically cheap. Uh, but the interesting thing is that if the runways are really long uh, and they actually end up being uh, runways that go on for you know, several decades, then even an expensive looking price can end up being a great value investment. But, but I think that as 
as value investors, you know, we have to also uh, have a good dose of skepticism in, in how we approach these things. So we can't always assume that, you know, everything's going to go to the moon in terms of, in terms of size and growth. And uh, the nature of capitalism is that there will be a lot of competition that will try to go up against those moats. But, but I think that I think that if um, you know there's a uh, there's a quote from the Upanishads uh, which goes something like this: uh, "As is your wish, so is your will." as is your will, so is your deed. And as is your deed, so is your destiny. And then kind of the punchline is your deepest desire is your destiny. So going back, you know, to what I started with, you know, if you said, I want to focus on 50 cent dollar bills, and that's your deepest desire, you will find those. If it's if you say, I want 20 cent dollar bills, you will find those too. If you say that I only want to invest in businesses that can go up a hundred times in value in 10, 20, 30 years, you can find those too. So it's a matter of what you choose to focus on. Uh, and as long as you're willing to put in the work to sift through company after company, and you know, with the framework that you're interested in. So in, in the case of the multi-bagger framework, there are just three things that matter. And then the fourth is the price, obviously. So if a business doesn't generate high returns on equity, you're done. You don't need to spend any time on that. If the business needs a lot of debt to grow and generate high returns on equity, you could also be done. You don't even need those. If management quality or ethics is a question, you're also done. You don't need those either. And so just, just if you look at the businesses that generate high returns and equity, that alone would wipe out large swaths of businesses. And then, you know, you get to the runway, right? So we can clearly uh, um, DMART will be a lot larger in 10 or 50, 15 years than it is today. I think that's a pretty easy bet to make. That the statistically, I think the odds are high that something like DMART might do well. Uh, we could uh, we could make that statement about private sector banks in India. You know, private sector banks in India might be like a third of the banking pie in India today. And maybe in 10 or 20 years, it might be half or two thirds of the pie, for example, and the pie itself will have grown. So, uh, so th there are, there are uh, things that we could hang our hat on and, um, and then kind of take it from there. So basically, I think that if you, if you go down this path, which is the multi-bagger path. Uh, the interesting thing is that, and, and, and all, all value investing, there are a couple of data points. You know, John Templeton used to say that the very best value investor or analyst will be wrong one out of three times. Like 33% error rate is the lowest error rate for the very best practitioner of the art. Uh, if you were a kind of brain surgeon and you had even a 3% error rate, there might not be too many people coming to you for brain surgery. Uh, but I think in terms of value investing, uh, you could be wrong half the time. And I think I've probably been wrong close to half the time and still end up with a phenomenal track record. So, and especially if you focus on the multi-baggers, you know, companies that would go up 10x or 100x. Basically, in a lifetime of investing, if you end up, ended up finding just two or three or four hundred baggers 
at the age that you're at right now. Um, that's all you need. In many cases, if you just found one, that might be all you need. And, uh, and so we have all this time. And on the other end, we just need to find uh, things just once. Don't even need to find them that many times. Uh, when I started investing, uh, started my journey value investing about 27 years ago, 94, 95, in the first in the first five years when I was not running my funds, I was just running my own money. I started with about one million dollars in ninety five. By the time in the first five years, I had had uh, two hundred baggers uh, in the first five years itself, and then I think from two thousand to 2022 now, uh, I haven't had any 100 backers. Uh, but I think that there might be some, some more in the future, uh, some that are kind of you know, still hopefully going through the, their journey. Uh, so so you, don't need, uh, you don't need very many of them. Um, uh, a few of them can get you to the promised land. And I've had, I would say, I've had when I look back, uh, a rather sloppy journey um, as an investor because I was trying all these different things. If I think if in 94 or 95 I had done what I am telling you to do now or suggesting what you should do now, I think I would have done a lot better than how I've done. So if I had purely focused on the... 10 or 100 baggers, then uh, it would be, uh, I think, I think the, the results would be vastly better. And uh, I remember in, uh, in 95, January 95, uh, when I had the $1 million, I'd mostly invested in the US markets. But I had an I had a interest in the Indian markets as well. And I thought there were two or three areas where it could do well. And I decided to put 20,000 out of the $1 million, just, uh, just 2% of the portfolio into India at that time. And I opened a, a brokerage account. Uh, and so just my own money, so I opened an NRE brokerage account with Kotak and um, I decided to put half that money, $10,000 in one stock, which was a IT company. And I was in the, I was in the IT services business at the time. So I knew, I knew this business really well. Um, Satyam Computers, which at that time actually was a pretty honest company. They kind of went wayward, I think, in terms of their ethics about 10, 12 years after that. Uh, but in 95, they were a clean company. And, um, so I put 10,000 into Satyam and, uh, in 95, and I think by the time it was 2000, it had gone up 150X. Um, the 10,000 had become one and a half million dollars, approximately 1.4 million or something. And then the remaining 10,000, I put into three other stocks. Um, I bought two of the courier companies that were listed in India at the time, Blue Dart and Skypack Courier because my perspective was that the Indian Postal Service was just hosed. And if you really wanted to get a package from point A to point B in India, you really had to rely on private people to get it for you. I don't think the Postal Service was reliable. And so I thought that these businesses that were focused on that would do quite well. And um, so I was just going to make three investments actually, uh, half in Satyam and then half in these other two. And then at the last minute, I was also very impressed with Kotak because I was just very impressed in dealing with their people. And so I decided to uh, split the other 10,000 three ways, you know, one about 32, 3,300 in Kotak and 3,300 in the other two businesses. So when this 10,000 became 1.4 million or whatever uh, in 2000, the other three businesses had done nothing for five years. It was pretty much sitting close to what I had paid for them. 
like no movement for the most part. And um, so I said, well, you know, it is not realistic to think that if you put $20,000 in the Indian market and you get, you know, 1.4 million, something like a 70X, that you there's still some meat on the bone and there's still some juice to be extracted, if you will. So I said, this is a pretty good result. And for no really good reason, in 2000, I sold the other three stocks. And I told Kotak, you know, sell these stocks and just send me the, the money back. I basically liquidated the entire Indian portfolio in 2000. And uh, there, was no, there was no really good reason to sell Blue Dart or Skypack or Kotak. No particular reason that uh, uh, I had to do that. Uh, Kotak from 2000 till now is about a 500x. Um, Blue Dart is about a 300x. And um, Skypack went kind of backwards, I think eventually went bankrupt, but it was down like 90% or something. So basically there were massive home runs. There were two massive home runs, which like I said, I, I, there was no reason to kind of make that decision to sell, but that's what happened. And you know, I missed those two rides. And, uh, but even with the sloppy nature and kind of stupid analysis that I did in those sell decisions, uh, the end result was fine. And the remaining 980,000 that I'd invested in the US over the next four or five years by 99, 2000, it was about uh, 13 million or so. So that had gone up quite a bit because one of those, uh, one of those bets had gone up a hundred X, uh, hundred thousand became about 10 million or so. Um, so anyway, the thing is that even with a lot of sloppiness, what I'm saying is that basically what, what, when you look at that investing that took place then, just the two bets that were a hundred bagger were responsible for like 80, 90% of the returns. It didn't matter. The rest didn't matter if it all went to zero. Uh, the results would have still been, been great. And so that's the nature of this multi-bagger type investing is that it can tolerate a very high error rate. Um, and of course, your, your objective as an analyst should be to try to keep the error rate as low as possible. Uh, in uh, 2019, I, um, I was visiting Istanbul for the second time and uh, the Turkish market actually, I think is the cheapest market in the world because they've got just a lot of crazy macro things going on in the country, very high inflation and weird policies and everyone's exited and so on. In fact, Turkey reminds me of the Indian markets maybe in the early nineties or so on. And I ran into this business on my second trip in 2019, where the market cap was $20 million and the liquidation value was more than six or $700 million. Uh, it was actually a dollar bill trading for three cents, uh, which I don't think it never happened to me before then. So in the previous 24 years of investing, that never happened. And I think till I, leave planet hurt, I don't think it'll happen again. But basically, you know, if I look at this business, which I bought at, you know, three cents on the dollar, like the 20 million market cap, I, I was surprised with the volumes. Uh, O'Brien Funds owns one third of that business. And we pretty much got one third of the business for like $8 million or something. And um, so if the business did not increase in value, at all, but it got to fair value at some point, we would have a 30X return, 30 or 33X or something. But now we've owned the business over three years. They've actually increased value of the business quite a bit in the last three years. And it's run by phenomenal people, really good capital allocators. And I think they will increase the value of the business quite significantly in the years ahead. So, 
having learned my lesson from Kotak and Blue Dart and so on, the only thing I need to do with this business is do nothing. Just sit there and spend time talking to students like you so that the time is used up and not used to sell things. And uh, basically, hopefully 20 years from now, we still own that business. So if that business tripled in what it's worth, the value, like, you know, was 600 billion, million or something, let's say it became 2 billion, we would have a hundred bagger. And I think it can, it can triple its value in maybe five or 10 years. And it can keep going after that. I mean, the, the two people running it, they're not that old. So I think they could, they could keep compounding for a while. Uh, and, and so when I look at kind of that particular business and it's, it's a small part of the portfolio today, it's gone up, I think in the last three years, it's gone up like five, six X or so. Um, so it's gradually moving towards its, its value and so on. And, uh, but I'm just saying that, that the nature of these hundred baggers is that this one business could become bigger than everything else in the portfolio, even though we made such a small bet with it. So with that, I think uh, I'll stop there and uh, would love to hear what you have on your mind. We can talk about what I just talked about or stuff that is unrelated. So thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for the insightful session. It was so interesting to listen, uh, listen to you. Uh, now we will open the floor for questions from the audience. Those who want to ask that question can raise their hand. Uh, I will coordinate. Uh, okay, Sanil, you may go first. Okay, uh, so that, uh, thank you for this insightful session. Uh, so, uh, in this uh, today, we are uh, listen a lot that uh, value investing is uh, dead in the modern world. So, what is your opinion on this? Well, you know, all intelligent investing is value investing, and uh, so because we have so many stocks around the world. Uh, and because there are so many things going on with different companies around the world that, you know, like this news anchor, uh, Jim Cramer says, there's a bull, always a bull market somewhere. So I think that if one is a investment analyst and, you know, picks through stuff, um, uh, you will, uh, you will find that there are some parts of the markets and some parts of the, of the ecosystem that is, appears very overvalued. But you'll also find that uh, there's lots of things that are hated and unloved. And like, for example, you know, uh, Turkey is hated and unloved. So, uh, so there are always in, in the, it's in the nature of auction driven markets that they will overshoot and undershoot. I mean, one, one simple uh, uh, data point you can look at is look at the price of any stock on the NSC or BSE and look at the 52 week range on that stock. You know, it might be 50 to 150 or 100 to 200 or 500 to 1000. It's a, like a 50%, 100% swing in one year for almost every stock like all 5,000 stocks, right? But if you look at, for example, uh, the cost of an apartment in Mumbai, for example, you know, apartment in Bandra or Juhu or someplace, and you have a friend who's a broker or an agent and you go to him every day and say, what is my flat worth? He'll say, your flat is worth three crores. And then you go to him the next day and say, what is my flat worth now? you'll say it's still three crores. And then you go to him after one week and you ask him again, what is my flat worth? He'll say, listen, idiot, it's still three crores. And you keep bothering this guy every day. And then maybe after three months, he might say, you know, it's actually 3.1 crores. 
you know, it has moved a little bit. It's 3.1 crores. Now I can get you 3.1 crores. And then maybe in six months or eight months, if you keep bothering him and he's still your friend uh, every day, maybe it becomes 3.3 crores in a, in a year or something. Okay, possible. Maybe three and a half crores. Or might go to two and a half crores. You know, the fluctuation rate of that flat is not going to range between three and six crores in a year. It's going to be like 2.7 to 3.3 crores. It'll be in a very tight band. Because that price is not being set in an auction format. It is being set with an intelligent buyer facing an intelligent seller. And when you have intelligent buyers facing intelligent sellers, you get great price discovery. But when you have this you know, auction-driven markets, which is the NSC or BSC or New York Stock Exchange, uh, you will get much wider swings. And so if you're in a... In, in the business of investing, where you are dealing with auction-driven markets, uh, just this phenomena of the 50% swing means at some point the stock is mispriced. It has to be at one, it has to be either underpriced at some point or overpriced at some point. Because the real value of the business cannot change 50% in a year for most businesses. So hence we have proved that there is always value in investments and markets. Thank you, sir. Okay, we, you can ask your question. Thanks. Uh, Monish, so the, my, my question is essentially around specifically to India. We have a lot of corporate governance issues within India. So when you are picking companies, how are you filtering out these companies which have uh, significant corporate governance issues which are now or later? For example, Satya that had massive issues later on. So what kind of filters do you use when you're investing or picking? Yeah, so I think, I think that, uh, yeah, I think your filters need to be stronger uh, investing in India than I would have in the US. I think that if I were to invest only in the New York Stock Exchange type businesses, the odds that I would lose money because of fraud approaches zero. You know, I would say if I make 10 investments all in the New York Exchange and I have a lifetime of investing I do just in that market, maybe out of, you know, 50 investments I make in a 40, 50 year period, at the most one might be fraudulent, something like that. It would be, it would be a pretty low number. In India, if I did the same thing, I think the number would be higher. But I think the... The, that given that we already know that, that the ethos levels of, let's say, managers or ma managements in India may be somewhat lower than the ethos level of a typical NYSE comp listed company, we can adjust for that. So there are plenty of businesses in India where one can reach a fairly decent conclusion that the ethics and ethos of the business and the owners is high. And there may be a lot of businesses where we may not be able to make that determination. So if we either know that ethics is low or governance has issues, or we're not able to figure it out, you could just take a pass on those businesses. And just like you would take a pass on a low return equity business, you know, it could be very ethical, but return equity is low. And uh, because there's 5,000 listed companies, you would still end up in a decent universe to look at. So I think, I think if, you, if you set up rigorous filters for ethics, uh, it may not be foolproof, but you can reduce the error rate. Thanks. Uh, okay, but you can ask your question. Oh, thank you for your great session. Uh, my, uh, my question is that how, what is your strategy in identifying and valuing a company? And how do you identify if a stock is overvalued or undervalued? Yeah, so I think that, uh, I think if a business is within your circle of competence, uh, I mean, let's, let's take uh, the example of a business like DMART, for example. 
And let's say I have not looked at DMART recently, but let's say, for example, on a trailing PE basis, it's trading at 100 times earnings, which you know it used to trade at, or maybe still trading at something like that. Uh, if one understood the business and one had a good view of what the cash flows of the business are over the next 10 or 20 years, you can discount those cash flows back. And then that would tell you whether the business is overvalued or undervalued. It would just be a straight math exercise. So, and if you are not able to estimate those cash flows, then I think there's no basis on which you could make an investment like that. So you would take a pass in that particular case. Um, so the first question to ask yourself is, do I understand the business? And is the business within my circle of competence? And if you understand the business and the business is within your circle of competence, then by definition, you know with some boundaries what, what the future of the business is likely to look like and what the trajectory is likely to look at, what the cash flows are like, likely to look like. And I think if you can put some boundaries around that, then you have a basis to make an investment. Uh, in, in 2015, uh, an Indian guy living in Vancouver, Canada, uh, his name is uh, Parry Pasricha, he had sent me, I, I didn't know him, uh, he sent me a write-up of a company based in Hyderabad called Rain Industries. Uh, and basically at that time, uh, it was an extremely well-written write-up, like 20 page PDF. It's actually, I think that write-up is floating on the internet. So I think if you if you just Google like Parry Pasricha Rain Industry, probably that PDF will pull up. Uh, there's another guy, Luca Franca, who had done a, report on rain and I think that's also in the internet somewhere. Uh, that was done before Perry did his report. Uh, but basically the, the situation that Perry was bringing up in that report was that rain was trading at I think 35 rupees a share at that time. And um, about a, you know, 170 or 180 million dollar market cap at that time with about $2 billion in revenue. It was trading at about one-tenth of sales. The price to sales ratio was 0 0.1. And um, uh, it seemed very likely that in the next four or five years, in a single year, Rain's earnings would be over 35 rupees a share. So when I looked at Rain, it's a very cyclical business. It has a lot of gyrations, a lot of issues with it but it was extremely cheap. In effect, it was trading at a future PE of one. And uh, I couldn't find anything wrong with it. So I made, I made a bet on Rain Industries and as a foreign investor, we could only buy 9.99%. And so we bought 9.99% of the business for like, I think $20 million. And uh, by less than three years after we bought in early 2018, late 2017, um, it was trading at over 400 rupees a share. So my, my thesis when I originally invested was that I think I thought, I just want to own this business when the earnings are 35 rupees. And I just want to see what the market would do with the price of the stock when the earnings are 35 rupees a share. I just want to see if it actually sits at 35 rupees at that point. And which I didn't think was possible, but I just wanted to see what happened. So this was just a pure math game. And of course, when the earnings, I think the earnings were coming to close to 10 rupees a quarter, when they were approaching nine or 10 rupees a quarter, the stock went to like 440 rupees. And of course, by that time, I had fallen madly in love with Rain and its great management and their very high ethics and very, very, uh, very honest, competent operators. Uh, and uh, I said, no, this is a this is a far better business than I thought it is, and you know we shouldn't get off the bus so quickly. And um, you know, all, most of the time, my problem has been I get off the bus too quickly. So rain went from thirty five rupees in twenty fifteen to four hundred and forty rupees in early twenty eighteen to sixty rupees in 
March of 2020, when COVID hit, to about 160 or 170 rupees currently. Okay. And we still own it. Right. And, uh, but even if you take the current situation, you know, with a 160 or something in, in rupees, it's like a 4x in seven years, for example. And, you know, we think it'll do better and be worth more in the future. So I think in that case, you know, like I said, it's, it's like we, I couldn't, I don't, I, I still don't have a crystal ball on rain of what next 10 years of cash flows would be. That's, I think, impossible to estimate. But I think the fact that we would make money on that investment was a very high probability. Uh, sir, in the interest of time, uh, can we take two or three more questions? Uh, if it's, you know, okay. Sure, sure. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. yeah, Rajat, you may ask your question first. Uh, thank you, sir, for sharing your wisdom on value investing in public auction markets. Uh, my question digresses a bit. It is for the private markets, venture capital in particular. I want to understand what parameters will you employ for investing in early stage startups from a value investing lens in the context of A, where price discovery, as you mentioned, is ambiguous. B, given the current news of funding winter and the capital drying up. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, I'm probably not the right person to ask that question to. I think the the closer you go towards the formation date of a business uh, and then try to extrapolate the future of that business, the more murky it becomes. And so the, the venture capital game is a very different game in the sense that you are expecting most of your returns to come from one or two bets in the fund, for example, and you're expecting 80, 90% of the fund may, a lot of those investments may go by the wayside or may not do much long-term. So basically it's, it's a very different game. Uh, I think it's very hard to get downside protection in the venture game. And I think it's very hard to do these future cash flow projections and all of that because we just don't have the tread marks. We don't have the, the historical tread marks. So, uh, it's it's not something that I think I have expertise in. The other thing about the venture business is that if we look at uh, the statistics, you know, so the, in in Silicon Valley, which has had a very long history of venture capital, the venture funds that have let's say the top ten percent, you know, they're Analyze returns are in the top 10% of venture funds. Um, their returns are multiples of, so the, you know, the top quartile funds have done much, much better than the bottom quartile funds. And if we do the same thing with bond funds, for example, the difference between a top quartile bond fund and a bottom quartile bond fund may be almost non-existent might be like 100 basis points or 200 basis points. It would be a very, very small difference. So what I'm saying is that the ability to add alpha in a bond fund is very limited. And if we, if we, look, at a, if we look at a fund like you know, Sequoia Fund or Andreessen Horowitz or Y Combinator, et cetera, um, they have an advantage. They have multiple advantages, but one of the big advantages they have is deal flow. So I have some friends and you know, some of my investors are venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. They say to me that if, if we had access to the trash can of Sequoia, our returns would be three X what they are. So if, he said, if, we, if we could just look at every deal that Sequoia turned down, we would do three X better because they said, we just don't get to see. You know, so deal flow. So one of the, one of the things about the, public markets is the small investor actually has a huge advantage over the institutional investor. An institutional investor with you know, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars cannot look at small investments. They, just, they have to put large amounts of money to work at a time. A small investor having you know, five crores to invest or 
50 lakhs to invest, 10 lakhs to invest, can look at everything, can look at nano caps, can look at everything. And so their universe is much wider and they can be a lot more picky in terms of where they put their money. So in the public markets, the small investor has a huge advantage. In the venture market, a small investor or an unknown investor with no, no access to real deal flow is at a huge disadvantage. So my conclusion when I look at all of that is it's not a game where the odds are in my favor. And so I have chosen not to play in that area. And I think the kinds of questions you're asking, I think are very difficult questions to answer. Uh, understood, sir. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, we will take only last two questions. Uh, Priyansi, you may go. You may go. You can go first. Thank you so much, sir, for this insightful session. And uh, so uh, can you increase your volume? I can. I can't hear you. Uh, am I audible now? Uh, I don't know if the others can hear you or not, but I can barely hear you. But okay. Go ahead. Okay. We'll we'll try in the chat box if that will help. Uh, maybe one of you can repeat the question if you can hear it better. I think she's putting her question in the chat box because uh, she's not able to increase her volume. Yes, sure. Uh, so I will repeat. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I can, I can see it. Let me take her. Yeah. yeah, I think I think for a know nothing investor, uh, passive index investing is a great way to go. Uh, especially if you have you know many decades of time and you're young and so on. Uh, I think uh, index investing does well. The frictional costs are low and such. If you have a view and you understand certain businesses, you understand they're undervalued and, and so on, then I think you could actually you know, pick stocks and so on. But I would say uh, starting baseline, being a passive investor is certainly a great way to go for most people. Vaibhav, uh, uh, you can ask your question next. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for an insightful uh, session. So my question is uh, very simple. So when we look at value investing, which was being uh, propagated by, say, the likes of Ben Graham, we did not have uh, the modern situation, right? An area of uh, negative real rates for a longer period of time, uh, but then liquidity, both absolute and relative. So do you think that probably sticking to that value investing may result in uh, risking probably figuring out who the future winners could be or simply put uh, probably what would you change in value investing which is being taught or which is being uh, learned to something which would be more relevant in a current context yeah i think it's a good question so i think that uh, most investors would be better off if they completely ignored everything macro. So for example, if, if I had a viewpoint of kind of what would happen to Starbucks 20 years ago, it really doesn't matter what the rates are and what the Fed is doing and what, you know, what financial crisis is happening or whatever else is happening. At the core, the Starbucks business is such that when they open a store in the US, they get their money back in two years, 35% return on capital. They, they, they don't franchise any stores. And when they open a store in China, they get their money back in 15 months, like something like 70% return on capital. And I mean, they have found, for example, that if they have one store in Manhattan in a particular intersection and they put another store diagonal from that store, it doesn't even cannibalize the first store when the second store is so close. And so, so it's, an, it's an incredible business. Uh, so I think that if one focuses on understanding the business and is able to identify 
uh, great businesses. Uh, that should be where the focus is. Uh, when I made the investment in Turkey in this, in this business, it was completely irrelevant to me what was happening on the macro front. I mean, Turkey inflation rates are crazy and the, the way they deal with the currency is crazy, but I, was, I, I could look at that business and see that these things would not really matter uh, in terms of our returns. And basically, when I made the investment in that business, uh, $1 was five lira. You know, five lira could get you $1. Now it is almost 18 lira to get $1. So I have suffered incredible devaluation, but in dollar terms, we are up four or five X. In lira terms, we are up infinite X, but who cares about that? Uh, so what I'm saying is that we had extreme headwinds, uh, macro headwinds when we went in, didn't care about it and it didn't matter. Uh, so I think it's it's very important to be right on the business. If you were early on McDonald's and Walmart or any of these, you know, MasterCard, Visa, whatever, uh, Coke, and so on, I think the thing is that, you know, some of these, you know, long runways, they will transcend everything. And uh, that's the key is can you find these great businesses? Can you find them early enough? Can you buy them at decent prices? And then can you be patient through thick and thin? Sure, that's that's very helpful. Thank there's you. a there's a investment bank in Nariman Point, Enam. Most of you will be familiar with Enam, and um, you know they took Infosys public. And when they took Infosys public, they were having difficulty placing the stock. You know they were the underwriter, and they were left with stock that nobody was willing to buy. And uh, so Enam kept the stock for themselves. And uh, until pretty recently, they kept most of those shares. I, I think they may have, they may have uh, reduced or eliminated the position now or it's a small, much smaller position. But basically, it doesn't matter what else Enam did in the last 30 years. It's irrelevant what they did in the last 30 years. 90% of the value of that firm was based on whether or not they kept that Infosys stock that nobody wanted. And, uh, and so it's a good business. They're great people and they're smart people, but one decision, you know, trumps all the other decisions. And if they had sold Infosys or they had found a lot of people willing to buy it, I think Inam would be a shadow of itself where it is today. So, you know, it's just small, small things like that create huge deltas in where things end up. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, can we take up one last question by Pawan, if time permits you? Of course. Yes, Pawan, you can ask your question. Uh, thank you so much, sir, and thanks a lot for your wisdom, sir, today. So, uh, my question is regarding uh, multi-baggers, as we discussed. So, during our holding period of, say, 10, 15, 20 odd years, we see drawdowns of over north of, like, 50%, sometimes even 90% during the tenure, investment tenure. So, how do you deal with that uh, situation? And it often arises when you're holding for such a long period of time, especially for multi-baggers. Yeah, so... Conviction is really important. And how do you get conviction? I mean, I think, I think you get conviction because you have a very strong understanding of the business. So um, if, I, if I go back to the, the business in Turkey, for example, uh, Basically, you know, that business has a number of different uh, business lines, but the one that has the most value today is they have 12 million square feet of prime warehouse space in Turkey, and it's mostly in Istanbul. And that 12 million square feet 
has a value today, uh, you know, you could go to a broker, he will tell you that you can sell the whole thing and you will probably get a billion dollars for it. Something like that, billion, billion two or something. There's only about 100 million or 80 million of debt. So if you just liquidate that entire position, you'll get about maybe $900 million or something. And, you know, so what is a warehouse? So warehouse is land, concrete, steel, some 20% is refrigerated. So you have some refrigerated units and all that. All of these things are going to increase in value if you have inflation. So steel price is going to go up because it's going to, it's going to track international steel prices. Uh, concrete and cement prices will track international concrete and cement prices. And land also has prime land in a prime, uh, you know, major city in the world has a value. And so when I invested, the value per square foot was about $80 a square foot for land and improvements. And I don't think that $80 is going anywhere. You know, it, it may be 200 a square foot at some point, but it will not go to 30 a square foot. That won't happen. Uh, so, so I don't care about anything else that's going on. That is the piece that is the most important. You know, it's 99% lease, it's 10 years inflation index uh, leases and all of that. So conviction is really important, right? So if you, if you invested in Starbucks, you would have two or three things that you understand. You would understand the unit economics, that when they open a store, they get their money back in one or two years. You would understand that. If that suddenly changed where it was taking five years or 10 years to get your money back when you open a new store, something has changed, right? That's a significant change. If that looks like a secular permanent change, the thesis has changed. But if, you, if, if it continues to be very high returns of on capital. The second is you would have had some perspective on the runway where you say, okay, it has 5,000 stores around the world, for example, it probably has more than that right now, but at 20 years from now, I think it can easily be 25,000 stores, for example. And if you have conviction on that, then you know, you, the two pieces that really matter is that what are the unit economics and what is the store count? You know, and those are really the pieces that matter. And so, when you make an investment in a stock, you should be able to explain the thesis of that investor, investment in five or 10 sentences to a 10-year-old without a spreadsheet and without anything. And this is why this makes sense. And that gives you the conviction. If you have to go look at a spreadsheet or go look at something to then, you know, when price drop 50% to understand what is going on, uh, you have not done your homework. So it needs to get down when you've done all the work to simplicity. You know, it can take a long time to get to those essence uh, of these businesses, but it needs to get to the essence of those businesses. So you have to get to understanding why is this, this business resilient? Why will it be around 10 years from now? And why will the economics and the return on equity and all of that still be high? Why will all those things be true? And uh, so we aren't particularly concerned with price movements. We are concerned with the expansion or shrinkage of the mold. If the moat goes through a secular decline, we have a problem. Uh, the quoted price changing is not relevant. Good, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for your insights. Before we conclude this amazing session, SBM NMIMS would like to extend a heartfelt thanks to Mr. Monish Pabrai for sparing his valuable time to grace this event and enlighten us with some really practical practical and usable words of wisdom. We would also like to extend our gratitude to all the attendees for their unabated attention to our event and for some really good questions. We definitely have something to take back home. What was more intriguing for us was how you identify stocks, whether it is through Chuck Ackery's three legs tool, which can become multi-bagger, 
for example, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, etc. And I'm very, I'm very sure if we replicate this approach, we can make money for ourselves. If knowledge is power, then curiosity is the muscle. Let's keep up this curiosity forever. On, the, on that note, we reach the end of the session. Have a great day, everyone. Thank yeah, you. and I would just uh, I would just like to say that I think you guys are the cream of the crop of India. You are the future of India. You're at a great institution, and you guys will do really well in the decades ahead, in whatever becomes your eventual you know career pursuit. So uh, I think you've already kind of won the lottery, if you will. So the world is your oyster, and congratulations. Thank you, sir. All right.